Okay, today is February 14th, 2019, Valentine's Day. Uh, my name is Lisa Wadowitz, and I am an associate professor of history at Linfield College in McMinnville, Oregon. And I'm here with Alicia Harder, class of 2020. And we are on the phone with Erwin Jack Shanahan and his son, Dave Shanahan, who live in Sunnyvale, California. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. So to get us started, we just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit more um, about your background, like where you're from, where you grew up. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself before you became affiliated with Linfield College. Well, I lived in McLinville from uh, the 1940s, and uh, actually before that, um, I guess it was about 38 and 39, we moved to McLinville from Portland and become, became, uh, well, associated with a lot of the professors and uh, and a lot of the friends on campus. So Linfield was sort of our second educational spot for, ki for kids. Uh, Don Taylor's father was professor of chem chemistry, and so we built our own chemistry lab in the, in a building in the back of our, we had about seven acres in McMinnville uh, on the outskirts. And uh, so we were pretty closely associated from the get-go to Linfield. So that was um, one of your friend's fathers was a chemistry professor? Yeah, yes, Don Taylor. Okay. Was, was, uh, professor Taylor was a chemistry professor. And so we kids built a chemistry laboratory until my father heard that we were going to drop <laughs> a bomb over the Davis Street Bridge, and and it was a pretty good size detonation to be. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we uh, had our chemistry lab, uh, chemistry lab, um, yeah, confiscated <laughs> by my father. <laughs> he didn't want to blow. He didn't want us to blow the bridge up. Well, where did you, where did you move to from? Where, where did you live previous? You moved from Portland, but weren't you born in, in... I was born in Sheridan, Oregon. And, uh, Sheridan, Oregon. Yeah, Sheridan yeah. was my birthplace. And uh, and I spent uh, many years in uh, McMinnville. I went to high school there, graduated from high school there, graduated from Linfield there, too. So you went to, to Mac High? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. Okay. Played the, played the trombone. No, played the sousaphone in the in the band. I wanted to play. I wanted to travel with the, with the, with the basketball gang, and that was one way to get transportation was to play a sousaphone. <laughs> so I did that. So you got to go to a lot of the high school games. All of them. All of them. The uh, sousaphone. It's such a big bell, has such a big bell on it, and I was carrying it around McMinnville on a bicycle, and <laughs> that wasn't easy to do. So, I forgive my ignorance. I don't know what a sousaphone is. It's the biggest horn in any band. It's like a tuba, it's, but okay. it's different. It's a, it's got a bell on it about 36 inches across. And uh, you, they have them polished up, and they have sometimes three or four of them in a band, you know, a marching band, and they it's the biggest instrument in any band. It, it's named after John Philip Sousa, the guy who wrote all those marching songs. Oh, wow. Okay. And you would ride around with it on your bike? <laughs> yes. <laughs> had no other way to get to uh, Mack High across town. I had to ride a bike. When the wind was pretty high, it was kind of tough. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> so then you were aware of Linfield since you lived here in town and went to the local high school. Is, and is that why you decided to attend Linfield? Is because it was familiar and close? I think I got a, a little scholarship, if I recall, too. So that helped. In those days, a quarter was, was a big amount of money. <laughs> Look what I found. 
Oh, Sorry, we're having a small celebration here. I just found a, a wallet that had been missing. <laughs> uh, it was in the bathroom. You're kidding. <laughs> Is that right? All right. Sorry, digression. No, that's, I'm, I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah, that's been lost for about six yeah. months. And, uh, <laughs> and he's, he's not a cheap date when he doesn't have his wallet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's that smart kid talking in the background. <laughs> well, I think it seems like a, a very sound strategy. <laughs> if you don't have your wallet, how can you pay for things? <laughs> that's why Dave is always broke. All right, all right. I, I'm done. I'm done digressing, you guys. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, what about the college appeal to you? Well. <laughs> I kind of grew up with it I, uh, mm. from the fourth grade. I lived in McNeville and um, went to Columbus grade school and, and Cook grade school. I went to both of them. And um, they probably kicked me out of one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we, we uh, knew everybody in McNeville. And uh, how big was the town at that time? Was the college like a real big por portion of the town? No. Because there were well, too many college towns right around there. Well, it was big in property. It had a, quite a bit of property. And uh, so we had a big campus. We had a wonderful May Day every year. And uh, I was a member of the Intercollegiate Knights. As they were IKs, they called them. And uh, we were the escorts for the May Queen and all her escapades during the May Day celebrations. We watched her with our white sweaters and there's a IK symbol on the front of the sweater. We were quite a, quite a, a distance around campus. It's like a parade or yeah, right. They were, it was, it was her introduction to that May Day queenship. Oh, okay. So she had a crown on and uh, a very, very, she was doll, dolled up very nicely. And, uh, we had a lot. McMinnville was a very warm town for college students. They treated us very nicely. And did you participate in the May Day celebration every year? Every year, yes. The intercollegiate nights. I'm not sure they still exist, but they, we had white sweaters and uh, pull so pullover sweaters with a big IK symbol on the front, and we went to other conventions. I remember we went to the state of Washington, Wenatchee, Washington one time for a big celebration from the IKs. And we went to the Midwest also on another one. So it was like a service organization. Absolutely. You know, things like that. Yeah. Right. And so we'd wear these white sweaters with this, this symbol was built into the sweater. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so we had we were a service organization, and we would um, uh, escort the queen um, on campus activities and off. And uh, right. that was a lot of fun. We I have some pictures someplace, but I have no idea where they are. Uh, well, we can run around and see. Well, We'll see if we can't find those for you, if, because that would be easier to describe than words. Right. No, and we have some photographs from um, in okay. the archives from the the yeah. yearbooks. Oh, oh the, from the yearbook. From the yearbook. Yeah. Yeah. The inter the intercollegiate nights were called IKs, and they had white sweaters, and this, and this big logo or emblem. It's an emblem on the on the front of the sweater. And uh, a lot of the Delta Psi Delta people were members of the IKs. And then Delta, Psi, Delta Psi Delta became ATO. I think it's still on campus there. Yeah, Alicia is saying it is. Mm -hmm. And so you were a member of the Delta Psi Delta fraternity, if I remember correctly? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. yes, I was for four years. And... Uh, I fell out of a tree, or a limb broke in the back of the Delta Psi Delta house, 
and I broke both arms and both wrists. And oh. That didn't make my day. But that's before you were in college. No, that was in college. Oh, well, in college. I think it was just be, just before. Between. Okay. So did I you remember? Did you all share a house then, or was it different? Oh well, yes, we, the Adela, Adela house was on Baker Street, and it was a two-story or three-story, and uh, I've forgotten the, the exact address. I've toured the campus, but I don't remember. Is there like a Greek row that you guys still have? Yeah, no? there's oh. a couple of, uh, only three of the fraternities. There's four on campus. Only three of them still have houses. Um, but the current Delta, Psi Delta fraternity has this big greenhouse. Um, I'm not sure what street it's on, but. Um, Baker Street house. Yeah, I think so, there. yeah. And now they're ATO. Well, they're affiliated with ATO, and I'm not sure what they call themselves anymore. They still know. call themselves uh, Deltas, I think, since they're they're the the one local fraternity that's still on campus. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. So, this uh, your service organization. Um, what kind of projects would you do when you travel to these other places? Oh, well, we. Uh, we represented Lindfield and we represented the intercollegiate nights and uh, we went to places like Spokane and Lewis and Idaho and, and places like that and we'd show up for some celebration on their local campus and we'd right. contribute being there with sweaters and paraphernalia. We had a so great time. It was not just a drinking club. No, exactly. No. <laughs> it was the Baptist school. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And were there other um, clubs or activities you were involved in on campus? Yes, quite a few. <laughs> and I can't tell you what because that's been a couple semesters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you continue playing in the, uh, uh, band? In the band yeah. at, at college? Yes. So you're. So that's three. So you're. So I was busy guy. Yeah. Well, and you were there for two years before the war broke out. Well, two years before I was invited to join the air force. Right, right. I wanted to fly, and so I volunteered. So, um, what was your first year at Lidfield? What year was that? 1941. 41. Um, so do you? Do you remember the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? Of course. <laughs> uh, I mean, of course, yes, I do. Yeah, well, just dramatically describe, you know, if you know where you were or what was going on, what was, did everyone yeah, think they were I was in the Euros dormitory uh, after we had a church affair in the afternoon, and I was there about in front of the radio. <laughs> we didn't have TVs in those days. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. no, I was just putting it yes, you okay. And uh, so I was over for some function in the girls' dormitory. And um, that's where I first heard about the December 7th attack. And uh, so then at that point, we prepared to go to war. So we were. I, I and, and and the whole my double side double attorney almost to a man volunteered and uh, so I went in the Air Corps and uh, I started my lifetime love of flying. And what was the just to go back to that day? Um, what was the general mood on campus? Wondering what the heck we were going to do. Yeah. To come home alive. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we really didn't know what was going on. Did people think they were going to invade the West Coast? or Oh, a lot of people were afraid of that. We were afraid of that. Um, but I, they shipped all we volunteered to the Midwest. I went to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. But what happened like that week, that day, where people just stunned? What were they doing? Oh, they were stunned, of course. When the, when the Japanese attacked American territory, you got a lot of 
two guys with guns <laughs> at their side, and they were carrying all kinds of protection. So did everybody tune in listen to the president? So tell them about it. They want to know what it was like that, that day, that week. The chaos reigned, and uh, it was very, very hard for anybody to have a logical plan for anything. Because uh, Pearl Harbor was uh, December 7th, of course, and uh, that rolled the, the uh, volunteer activity into high gear. And uh, so, was it like finals? I mean, it was at the end of the semester, coming up in December. What did they did they make? Did people take their exams? Or a lot of them did not, um, as I recall. Now, my memory. Is, in 41, it's not as good as it was yesterday. <laughs> but um, it sort of came as a result of the attack in Pearl Harbor. And so you didn't think it was strange that we were reacting to that. No, no, no. And uh, so everybody got behind them wherever and uh, started building airplanes and training for whatever. And uh, I volunteered for the Air Corps, and that's how I got out of McMinnville. And uh, right, yeah, that's how I left McMinnville. I didn't want to get out of McMinnville. <laughs> I like the town. I was on campus, and uh, our whole fraternity, almost to a man, volunteered for the service, or one service or another, or another. Maybe, maybe. Do you have any uh, more? Pointed questions that you're trying to uh, get a better feel for? No, we're just, we don't want to interrupt too much. You know, we just want to get a sense of, of uh, we know it was a momentous time, right? In a, in a really difficult time. So just getting your impressions of how you and your friends felt about it and what you were worried about um, is, is super useful, I think. I think the Delta Phi Delta fraternity contributed almost every member to the service. Right. And uh, some of them went Navy, some went Air Corps, as I did. And uh, a lot of us wanted to fly. Well, and was it like the whole, all the, the students all throughout the campus, were they everybody just signing up in droves? Or I don't, but they weren't talking about that because anybody was volunteering felt them felt obligated to sign up and shut up. Mm -hmm. So they didn't go around bragging about the fact that they just signed up for the service. Did you sort of feel that sense of duty and obligation to sign up after Pearl Harbor? Was that sort of a catalyst for you? I think so, yes, because we were pretty upset. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an unwanted, undesired, important attack in, in our lives because it changed it changed many of our lives completely, taking us overseas and uh, new responsibilities, new challenges. And uh, I uh, was out at the airport, and uh, a lady came up to me and said, um, you should be at work. I said, why should I be at work? I'm 14 years old. <laughs> and she said, well... I see you're flying a model airplane, and uh, her name was Bessie Holliday, and she lived in McMinnville and taught flying at the old Mac Airport about, about, toward, uh, toward Carlton, about three miles, if I recall. And uh, so she said, if you wash my airplane, I'll teach you how to fly. And so... When I got in the Air Corps, the first instructor I had said, oh, wait a minute, let's stop right here. Everything I asked you to do, you did perfection. With perfection, he said, you already know how to fly, right? And I said, yes. So we changed our curriculum a little bit. The, the name Pe Bessie Holliday um, is important to Oregon because she was the first lady that – gained notoriety in the aviation field from, from McMinnville anyway. 
and there was a 20-foot picture of her in the International Airport when I came back from the Philippines after the war. And uh, so she had been a heroine, apparently, in the war effort by teaching fellows how to fly. So can, just to clarify, so you met her here in town when you were 14? Yeah, I met the – well, I was, I was flying before that, but um, – but, uh, she, uh, well, everybody was sharing information with everybody at that time, and, and uh, she, she saw me flying a model airplane at the airport. And she, she said, uh, why aren't you working? <laughs> I said, well, I'm only 14 years old, so therefore <laughs> my father is still providing very, well, very nicely for me. <laughs> so we, we became friends, and... Uh, he said, well, if you'll watch my airplanes, I'll teach you how to fly. So that took about 30 seconds to make, make the affirmative decision, yes. So I watched her airplanes for a year or so, I guess. And um, the only thing that they were, the only dirty part of the airplane was the oil we collect on the belly. And that, that's one thing that Bessie Holiday did not like to climb on the ground on her back and wash the bottom of the airplanes. Didn't they name something at the airport for Bessie? Or like a, they had a big picture. A big picture in the, in the terminal? About 20 foot high. Oh yeah? <laughs> she had John Furs on. <laughs> Looks like he, she could uh, be riding a horse. Is that, the, is that the baggy pants? The, the, oh, what yeah. do they call them? Uh, John Furs, J-O-D-P-U-R-S. I believe it's a British term. Okay. It's Anne Cost. Yeah. And, uh, but she, she was a, 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 an Oregon heroine in the female aviation business and, yeah. and uh, taught me how to fly very well. I mean, she, she did a good job because I went to the Air Corps and the guy said, I don't need to teach you anything. Let me, <laughs> let me show you what I, I'm having trouble with. So we exchanged ideas. And <laughs> And the Air Corps treated me very nicely. So well, he has a history of famous instructors. He he got he learned how to surf from the famous Duke Kanamoku. Kanamoku, the guy who brought surfing to the Hollywood scene. Wow. Well, we'll have to work our way up to that. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> um, before I just had a quick question about um, you were already knowing how to fly when you enlisted. Was that was that common, or was that really unusual? It was kind of unusual. I didn't have many people in my class that knew how to fly. And uh, so the after-hours bolt sessions with the guys involved a lot of hand <laughs> and executing with the hands what you wanted your airplane to do it the next morning. And uh, oh. so they... So the the guys really became bonded to the benefit of everybody, right? And uh, we had an airport, a little airport outside of Macmillan toward Dayton. I don't presume it's still there. I have no idea. Is that where the one the career one is? Um, I beg your pardon. I'm asked, sorry. Alicia and I are trying to figure <laughs> out if it's. If it's the same one mm -hmm. as the current McMinnville where, Airport. Yeah, where there's a aviation museum over there and then also a airstrip. A little airstrip. Yeah. Yes. That's the same that's mm -hmm. the same airport. Okay. That little that, that little museum right now has um, some very interesting wait, that's not the Spruce Goose, is it? No. Spruce Spruce Goose is, is not there now, I don't think. It's in, in Ever Evergreen's place. Well that's that's, that's, this, um, that's where it is, right? Now. Yeah, yeah, this Bruce Goose is oh, at okay. Evergreen Aviation, yeah. Right, okay, yeah, with the big 747 mm -hmm. water slide. Or yep, yes. yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, David remembers that. He's, he's a great deal younger than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, all right, well, so, uh, so what happened? So how quickly did everybody go sign up? Was it made? Declare a war, and then, like, within a week, people were getting the recruiters? Or? Oh, well, they, they got the whole fraternity volunteered. Right, but, I mean, like, how quick did that happen? Was it Well, like, the volunteering happened right away, December 8th, probably. And uh, I don't remember the exact date, yeah. but December 7th was, was right. the, the day that started, and everybody 
Yeah, the day that and actually, live in infamy. That's right. And uh, Roosevelt's quotation was well put. Anyway, we we had a, a, a little flying in McMinnville Airport, and um, then I went in the Air Corps and uh, had quite a bit of flying after that. I've been I've, I've been flying ever since. I'm still flying. I still have an airplane, and uh, so, the weather's better down here than <laughs> where you're living. We know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it, his airplane was built in 1946, so not about the same era, and we're still flying it. Wow. Wow. So moving on a little bit just more into your military service, Jack, so where did you say that you uh, were stationed for training once you had joined the Army Air Corps? Yeah, I went to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Mm -hmm. And so while you were in Cedar Rapids uh, training, what was an average day like for you there? There wasn't any average day. <laughs> <laughs> Every day was different, I guarantee you. Tell them the lunches story. That was a good story. Which one? Lunches where you were, your flying lessons. Oh, yes. My instructor had a girlfriend, and uh, she worked in a combine. And uh, the combine harvested, I think it was wheat, but it could have been some other product. And the head would be taken off and saved and, and, and blown into a truck that held all the Whatever, I think I think it was sweet, but yeah, you know, big big harvester machine, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, that was um, a thing that we had to be be in, sure we were not injuring anybody around that machine. By the way, you girls did a good job in harvesting a lot of crops in Oregon. Well, but tell them the story. So your instructor figured out on the first day that he already knew how to fly. Yeah. So he said, I'd like to have our appointments for, for my training you how to fly at uh, 11.30 every every day. And we're going to go take your lesson between Cedar Rapids and where my girlfriend is working on a combine out in the farms. And uh, that worked out pretty well because her girlfriends would chip in and bring these fantastic lunches, and we we'd land out there in the oat field, and um, oat fields are not smooth, <laughs> so it was shake, rattle, and roll, and uh, we had a lot of fun. Um, so instead of instead of studying flying, they'd go go have lunch with the girls. Yeah. <laughs> But would, you would have to fly out to meet them? Is that? Oh, oh yeah. They just land in the field. We land in the field where, wherever they were working. <laughs> and uh, oat fields are not smooth. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's shake, shake, rattle, and roll when you land. <laughs> but uh, we had a good time, uh, and uh, that part of the war was no problem at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving into to the next stage of your military service, when what was it like? Like, where did you uh, get sent to after you were done with your training, and what was what that what was that like for you? Well, uh, I was shipped overseas, and I ended up in the Philippines, and uh, that was a very exciting period of time. I got the I was lucky enough to meet a lot of famous people, including the president of the Philippines. I knew, the, I knew two presidents very well, the family, their family, and, and had dinner at the Mark and the Aunt Palace. And, and so that was a tough part of the war. That's right. <laughs> but before you jump to the, to the end, so he was flying uh, B-24s, like on some of the islands, Christmas Island, and Places yeah. that nobody you've ever been, I mean, you know, just military, but really remote, Pacific. Uh, in the South Pacific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the, in the Canton, Canton Island and Christmas and Funafuti and Kwajalein were some of the places that we were flying all the time. And what and was, the, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say Canton was spelled K 
with a K-A-N-T-O-N, but they changed the spelling to a C-A-N-T-O-N somewhere during my training out there. Uh, there was a lot of water, and there was not many islands big enough to land the B-24. And uh, so we, we flew long distances. So, you know, wouldn't you, like, fly for hours, you know, uh, just with all water, with no, no land in sight? Yes, and no PBYs in sight. Yeah. A PBY is an amphibious airplane that the Navy used to <laughs> pick up drowned, or drowning air, air, airmen. And, uh, right, and, and sailors in, at sea and things. Right. Um, so so we're, we're rambling. How's your schedule doing? No, this is great. Mm -hmm. we're, we're taking notes. Um, we just okay. want to let you, you know, tell us your story. So did you... I'll, uh, did you ever Spell land me. on a on a ship? Did I do what? Did you Did ever you land an airplane on a ship? No. no. See, only the Navy had the carriers. Okay. And uh, they would let an Air Corps guy board. Yeah. Because he was pre-Air Force, the Army Air Corps. So oh, would, right. Uh, okay. Right. Land, land Before base. 1947. Yeah. At the end of the war, they created the Air Force independently. Yeah. By the way... Um, I, I, you asked me if I ever landed on a carrier. I sat along a Saturday carrier with a, a friend of mine, and uh, a, a funny, funny thing happened. A guy came out of the conning tower on the deck of the carrier, and we were sitting stationary right alongside the. Because the uh, carrier was like a fleet speed, flank speed, speed, speed. Yeah. and I was, I, I could just. Put my nose up and and sit there and do and so not fly, not move at all. And, and this guy came out of the conning tower, and which is the superstructure, the big tall part of the ship. And uh, he moved his head so fast when he saw this thing sitting out there, <laughs> 15 feet from before he was coming out of the conning tower, and uh, right across the deck. And he uh, turned his head so fast. He lost his old white hat. Oh, really? <laughs> it rolled, rolled off his hair. <laughs> anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, my next question for you is I know that uh, when we talked previously, you had a really interesting story about um, a time when you came back to Linfield while you were on leave um, about one of your friends flying uh, a plane near the library and around campus. I was wondering if you wanted to uh, tell Correct. us that story again yeah. today. That was not a friend. That was a cousin. Cousin. <laughs> and a close friend, by the way, <laughs> who graduated from Linfield. And he came home all because this story didn't go public. <laughs> <laughs> well, the people at Linfield thought that the, 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 the Portland papers were covering the story, and the Portland papers thought that military was handling the story because Greg Smith, my cousin, came home with a P-38 and he came, and he came roaring across campus very low between Pioneer and the gymnasium. And he had, he had to go, he, he, he had bank 90 degrees to the right and sliced through that area on a campus which you are familiar with that still exists. I guess at the last minute he saw a flagpole that was he didn't see before. That's right. So he had to go. Almost hit it. it. That's why he had wings vertical. Right. And, uh, and the right wing was down showing so he could see out at what he was flying past and right. to and through and, and, and he, he gunned it and shattered some windows. Yes, he wrote some windows. <laughs> and uh, he went through the Beside Pine, between Pioneer and the gymnasium, I don't know how the configuration is now, but in those days, he went straight past Pioneer at about 15, 20 feet off the ground, and and over to the over to the gymnasium. Do they, do they still call it Pioneer Hall or? Uh, oh yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, okay. So there's Pioneer, and actually, I believe we are in. The building that was the old gymnasium. We're in Riley Hall, is what it's called now. 
um, it's been converted. I haven't been on, I say, I've been on campus several times, but I, nobody, I didn't have any a guy, guy yeah. <laughs> to tell me what the things were updated to. Yeah. So just so. To, to clarify the story, um, so when he flew and he had to turn vertical to avoid hitting the flagpole, did his wing hit the windows, or was it that he was so Oh, no, this, this, this the noise that he, the he noise. Said, he went full throttle. Okay. Because he was kind of in a spot. And it's a, a, a P-38 is a big twin-engine, twin-boom. It was the fastest plane, I believe, in World War II. It was a super hot rod in the sky, and uh, it had two big four-bladed props. And if you, you know, gunned it, the giant Rolls-Royce engine, made a lot of rattling. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, that helps. <laughs> that break out the window. I think I remember you saying that they used to call that plane uh, the lightning bolt. That's right, the lightning, P-38 lightning, yeah. P-38 lightning, and then they had all black ones that were called the black cat, the black, yeah, but the, there was P-60, yeah, they had ones specifically for night missions. Oh. Um, but so then tell them about what he did, so he did that, and he he went down and uh, saw his father <laughs> and uh, looking for his father. And his father had a big farm and he was on his tractor. He knocked, I mean, he, he, he his father was, he buzzed his father so close that his father jumped off the tractor, didn't hurt him, but <laughs> he thought he was under attack. <laughs> uh, Here's the living daylight. <laughs> his name was Al, Albert, Alfred, Alfred Smith. And they used to own the, the restaurant and the service stations out of the Y. Is the Y still there? Uh, Is that like two streets that come together? Or? Yeah, it's out, it's out toward Amity. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we're thinking. We're trying to... <laughs> well, if you go out, out of Mac uh, toward Amity uh, and Sheridan... Um, there's a Y. There was there was a Y there, uh, where the where the highway. I think it was who lived in the Red River Inn, the house. I don't know. Isn't that McMinn Mill though? That they made it into a restaurant. But, oh, that was Dundee. Oh, that was Dundee. Okay. And, uh, now we're diverting to another spot. Now, <laughs> my, my grandmother's house in Dundee became a, re a five star restaurant. I guess. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Red Hills. Is the Red Hills. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and the, the restaurant's called the Red Inn, I believe. Red something. I, I, Red Hills. Red Hills Inn. Yeah. It's been a, I think it, it closed down recently. Yeah. I think that's the same same place. I did hear it closed, too. Okay. But they may be, you know, somebody else will fire it back up again. It's been around for a while. And so. That was my grandmother. That was my grandmother, grandmother, grandfather's. 90 acres, I think it was, and uh, they grew about everything there, including uh, one product that nobody I've ever met has ever heard of called a black cap, and it was a red raspberry, but it was black, <laughs> oh. and it looked, if you take the raspberry, which still grows in Dundee, uh, alongside, alongside of 99, uh, it looks like um, a red cap, like a ras raspberry, I guess, yeah. and it's got a stem inside, and it pulls off clean and like nice. And, yeah. and, and, the, and the, but nobody in the world I've ever talked to around the world. I've been uh, quite a few places, <laughs> and they've never heard of the word black cap, C A P, because that's the black the the, the, the berry attaches to the stem of uh, the bush. And it uh, grows on, and uh, you pick it pick it off just like a well. It's got a stem, and it comes it comes off clean. And uh, it's the only place in the world I've ever heard being grown. <laughs> it's called a black cap. Yep. And, and I think people call them raspberries when they're red, and black caps when they're black. We're rambling along about well, berries. So <laughs> when, when you jump back to the to the war, so how did you end up when MacArthur took back the Philippines 
you ended up back on the Philippines or on the Philippines. Yeah. He was returning. I was getting just, yeah, first well, time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I met MacArthur. I have some pictures of him that I've taken of his. <laughs> MacArthur, I'll tell you a quick story. We were walking out of the, the uh, headquarters for MacArthur's activities, and uh, I said, General MacArthur, I've been following you around for a long time. I'd like to get a personal picture. Oh, yes. And so he grabs this crop and, and his helmet, and uh, I think it was a helmet that time because we were downtown Manila, and yeah. they never knew what was going to come from the sky. And uh, and he had his pipe. He had his pipe and his crop. And, yeah. Uh, and he was a, a consummate showman. And uh, when somebody wanted to put a camera in his face, he he had perked up, perked up right now, and became a different person. <laughs> well, in the family connection there, uh, my mother's father was uh, on staff with MacArthur and was the head of the uh, all military uh, intelligence in the Asian Pacific uh, theater before World War II. He was an expert, yeah. Wow. wow. Um, do you have any other particularly memorable moments from your military service that you'd like to share with us? I survived. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, we, we had a lot of flying stories, but I don't want to bore you with that because they're <laughs> – only a certain segment of the population is interested in flying <laughs> stories. So, well, what about, so after the war, you stayed in the Philippines? Yes, I did. I stayed seven years, and then I came back to Stanford and uh, continued my education. My grandmother from Dundee, Oregon, said, well, now, why don't you go back to school? Why don't you go to Stanford? I didn't think you should go to Stanford. <laughs> so my grandmother kind of pushed me into Stanford. <laughs> and I was grateful for it. And in, in, those, in those seven years, you started an airline that's still going today? Yeah. It was called Pacific Airways, and now it's called Cebu Pacific Airways. And uh, it's a pretty good-sized airline now. It's the largest Philippine airline. It's bigger than Philippine Airlines. Yeah. Wow. And how did you come to do that? Well, tell them some of the recreate or the you know uh, army surplus stories. Well, we, my friend and I, Al Armstrong from Yuba City, uh, it's spelled O N S. It's spelled O N S T O T T. Armstrong. He came from Yuba City. And there's a nonstop avenue in Yuba City. So it was a pretty prominent family up there. And um, and I lost my train. So you're, so you're starting the airline with all yeah. the... Yeah, so my partner from, from Yuba City and I went to Clark Field where they had hundreds and hundreds of surplus airplanes. And we only wanted airplanes we could carry, we could carry a few passengers with. And uh, so we took the Norden Norseman, which is a C-64, a single engine, carries about nine people or ten people. Or Filipinos, they could get 12, 14 in there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we started an airline from Cebu. We ran to Mindanao and Surigao and all over down the southern part of the Philippines. And there's a lot of water out there. Were they mostly seaplanes or land planes? Land planes, okay. And there was a lot of water down there. And uh, so we uh, took all the precautions we could. Flying land planes over long, long periods of water, long distances of water. And uh, we never lost anybody, never had a crash. And, uh, I flew there seven years, and then I came back to Stanford. My grandmother. <laughs> yeah, I thought of that. Well, but so like to start, didn't didn't you buy like a hundred Piper Cubs? You, you started a flying school too. Yes, we did for a dollar or something like that. No, I, I had to spend most of them were twenty five to fifty dollars. Oh, were they okay? Oh, okay. you got like ten thousand gallons of gas for a dollar. 
we we got a lot of gasoline free. So <laughs> the Navy had big tanks on Mackin Island near Cebu. And they said, Jack, do you want this gas? <laughs> free. Yeah. And so I had several thousand gallons of gas to burn up. And, uh, didn't you have a PT boat too? We did. We burned the same gas in PT boats. Yeah. <laughs> we had so we water skied behind the PT boat a lot in the Subu Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> and didn't, didn't they water ski behind the uh, what the airplane? Yeah. We have a movie of that. Yeah. They they're water skiing behind an airplane just above the water. They hand it off from a boat to the <laughs> plane. And uh, yeah, and, and so during this whole time, Jack was had a fancy um, 16 millimeter movie camera, um, the same kind that the like the uh, correspondence for Bayard Bullock. Bayard Bullock, yes, and, and he still has it, but um, same quality as a, a National Geographic photographer would use to to make the National Geographic films. And they offered me a job. Yeah. yeah. Film all of Africa. Right. But so he had got a lot of film of all these wild times in, in the uh, Philippines and uh, them out on outings with, you know, 20 people standing on the on the top wing of these giant seaplanes they fly around in. PBY. Yeah. A consolidated vault team. PBY had a wingspread of 104 feet. So it was, wasn't a toy. Yeah. Big, big plane. When you tell them that story, <laughs> it's a volcano. When, when the takeoff was a little tough. Well, we landed inside of a, uh, a volcano with water in the in the lake. Well, like Crater Lake, but yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> but uh, somebody had opened the, the vents in the rear of the airplane with a toilet or something. Yeah, and, and uh, it, it was, they thought it was a toilet, but it wasn't, and it filled with water. So we went roaring across this lake in the PBY, 100 foot wing spread, and uh, tried to take off. I couldn't get it off the. Off, I couldn't get it on the step. They didn't know all this water had, you know, leaked into the fuselage. Oh. Several times. Oh. Yeah. And that, and we were coming up against a 1,500 foot wall inside this crater. And uh, we had had to gently turn because we, we were just at the stall speed, and we we missed the the rim of the crater as we were circling inside of it, and we finally climbed up and got out. And, uh, and the water kept draining out of the tail. <laughs> well, we landed at Manila Airport, and uh, for the next three or four days. That thing dropped hundreds of gallons of water, wow. and so much water that the wheels sunk about four or five inches into the mud. <laughs> oh, man. And, and do, you, do you remember where the volcano was? Do I what? Do you, do you remember, remember where the volcano was? Oh, sure, 30 miles south of Manila. Oh, okay. it's called Lake, uh, and the volcano, the water in the bottom, like Crater Lake, is called. Lake Taal, T A A L, Taal. Tell them about Pinatubo. Well, Pinatubo was a volcano, different volcano. Yeah. yeah, north of Manila, about 40, 50 miles, that blew up. About that was that was recently, uh, well, the last 10 years. What, what was your what was year was Ibaki Bak? Hibaki Bak was a volcano island on the north side of Mindanao and the south of Cebu, about 60, 70 miles. You know, when we're flying, mileage doesn't mean much because there's no way of recording it. Yeah. Anyway, so we did, we had uh, we had a lot of experiences. That take me it take me all week to tell you the stories. <laughs> This is a good one. So this has to do with his bolex and the the Mount Ibakibak erupted, right? Right. And so everyone evacuated. So I, in the in the volcano, there was a 
a white marble statue. It was it was not square and it wasn't round, but it was it, it was not, not like it was shaved, but it stood about 130 feet high. It had been ejected out of the top of the volcano. It wasn't ejected. It was just it, well, yes, it, it, it raised up. Yes, and uh, it did it didn't fly. Right, right. But it was it was raised out of the volcano. And about 130 feet high, we estimated, because we couldn't fly down the inside of the thing. It was too, too tight. So this thing is erupting. So what does Jack do? He tries to find someone to go and film for him, and he can't find anybody crazy enough. So he goes by himself and flies around and around this erupting volcano with his filming with his camera out <laughs> the window and getting these amazing pictures of this this structure that only lasted a few days. Um, in fact, Stanford has a copy of that. Yeah. Because uh, Professor, anyway, yeah. the geology professor, yeah, the geology professor, and whose name slips me right now, but I can bring it back at 2 o'clock this morning. And, yeah, yeah, it'll come back. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it was, um, the volcano uh, erupted, and uh, Hibok, Hibok was the name of the, the volcano, and it was on the north coast of Mindanao, which is the biggest island in the southern part of the Philippines. And uh, so that Stanford has a copy of this because it's the only the only photographic record of the whole eruption in the right. world. And wow. Dr. Howard was there you go, Dr. Howard. He was so impressed with it, he wanted a copy of all that film for Stanford, and they have it now. Wow. Anyway, this is off off course for for your questions, I'm sure. No, this is this is fascinating. We're taking lots of notes. I bet that film must be amazing. Wow. It's a little it's a little rough because the hot, the super hot air was tossing the airplane around like crazy, but it's really good film. Wow. I don't think I have a copy of it anymore. I think we can take one out. But I gave that one to Sampa Dome. I, I, I've seen it, so I know it's got to be here somewhere. Okay. So. We're deciding that we may have a copy of that film. But. Huh. Well, but if it's at Stanford, they probably make it available to researchers, I imagine, right? Oh, I'm sure they would. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Howard was the one that, that really was instrumental in saving it. At Stanford, but he's probably dead by now. So, what was life like on the Philippines after the, the return? You know, right, right. You know, it was probably pretty decimated after the war. But well, they're they're very creative people. So the Philippines would do things that you know, we had an airplane that a student crashed crashed in the top of a of a um, coconut tree about 150 feet above the ground and, oh and this Filipino young pilot climbed out of this airplane and, and went climbed down through the low, the foliage on the on, on, the, on the palm tree the uh, coconut tree uh, 100 feet, 150 feet above the ground and came down the and climb down the so they climbed up these things very up. They scamper right up and wow. and he was good at that, so no problem. And then later he crashed he came out. he came down to visit his grandmother with the airplane. With one oh. with one of our airplanes. Right. And he pulled up and stalled into the top of the, the coconut tree. So that we both that and he had to climb that right. he, and then he, he scampered out. Oh, I ended up going to the just come down the next storm, or what? No, we went. We took the whole group down and made a tripod out of bamboo, and they got block and tackle, which is a bunch of pulleys, right? And uh, they just pulled the airplane off the palm tree, and then and lowered, then walked a, a tripod, and a tripod you walk one leg at a time, and and here came the airplane swinging back and forth up here, out of the boat, and these guys. Stuck with it, walk it, where they could bring 
it down right to the ground. So, and we we took it to the back to Dumaguete Airport, which is in Sinai, you know, Cebu, you know, one of the, anyway, the southern Philippines, and uh, not a scratch on the airplane. Mm. We flew all, we flew for years. Why don't you uh, tell them, you want to hear another just interesting story? <laughs> don't tell them. I'll ask you a question. Have you ever lost an airplane? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I have. Oops. <laughs> That's a, tell that story. It's a great story. Well, it started by we found a abandoned tower on an island. It was such a curiosity. We went and visited and uh, it was like a lighthouse. It was a lighthouse. And the lighthouse had a home beside it, a nice house. And uh, so um, we walked in, and it had been owned by the Japanese that abandoned it. And uh, during the war, and, uh, so we. Uh, opened up an airport, uh, a grass field, big enough to put a small plane in. And uh, had lots of escapades like that. But I'll, I don't want to bore these girls. So wait, 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 wait. So you climbed, you, you guys beached the, beached the plane, climbed up the tower. What did you see when you got to the tower? The, air, the airplane floating away. Yeah. <laughs> and they're on an uninhabited desert island. Oh, no. Uh-oh. So what did you do? We, we uh, I swam after it for an hour, and I, I had to go around the island because I wasn't going to catch it. The wind was so high and blowing it backwards, and it was blowing it in such a way that I couldn't climb these waves, every time I'd go over the, uh, a big wave, I'd flop down and lose, lose distance. And so I, I came back and watched the thing float away. Well, so but to, in racing down and chasing it, they were barefoot, and he ran out over all the corals and, and started swimming. And I cut my feet back. So he cut his feet all up, and then mm. they came back and tried to climb up to get a sighting on the plane to see if they could, you know, some somehow track it down. And then what did you see in the water? Well, we saw, let me tell you what we saw. We saw at our feet, um, watching, uh, we climbed, we found a compass rose, which it shows every degree from zero to 360. And uh, we could track the airplane because we could see it in the distance. So, uh, but what did you see in the water? <laughs> and then when we, after I got back, we saw, I've never seen so many sharks in my life. <laughs> they were all chasing the blood from his oh, feet. Man. So the whole water was just swarming with big sharks. Oh. They, were, they were big ones. At least eight feet. That was probably the smallest one there. And I didn't go swimming anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so how'd you get off the island? Well, let's see. I can't remember. Um, you were there for quite a few days. Oh, yes. Um, a fellow living in Palm Springs now, Steve Pyramidico, came in with a one of our seaplanes and uh, picked us up one at a time. But didn't he almost crash it, too, when he came in? Oh, yes. No, it wasn't a seaplane. It was a land plane. Right. Because we, we cleared off some brush. He gave him about 500 feet. And uh, I stood out there and waved at him. No way. Don't come in here. Don't land. He wanted him to go get help and not land and have three people stick at him. <laughs> so he landed and ran into all that brush. And... Uh, I, he stepped out of the airplane and said, Jack, let's go. I said, get back in that cotton-picking airplane and shut up.
got it on. It's, the propeller is just hitting all this brush, so oh. it's just making a terrible wreck. And uh, wasn't helping the airplane at all. No. So then you spent another day or two clearing the cleared brush to try and make enough of a runway to take off. Well, we wanted enough so that we could land this. Somebody could come in with an yep. airplane, that, and they, we did that. Yeah. Well, we're, we're telling you my life story. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, just to, for our notes, um, and what what was the what was that island? This was. Uh, I, I don't think it had a name. It was. Um, oh. It was just an abandoned, uh, you know, uninhabited island. So it had a had the tower, but nobody no, was the tower. I mean, the lighthouse. lighthouse. And uh, the the uh, the Navy lost a ship right close to it, and the and the sailors came aboard this this uh, location, and uh, to to attract attention, they took. The uh, big, huge chunks of glass that, that were oh, the that were involved in, in the lens, for the lens for the yeah for the uh, lighthouse, and uh, they threw it downstairs and uh, broke it all. Beautiful glass, it must have cost a fortune. And uh, but the but the reason they did this was to attract attention. If the lighthouse wasn't going, oh. Somebody all, would come and all the shipping would be disrupted, especially they couldn't go in there at night. Man. So they'd sell to send out a repairman to save them. Well, they, they sent out the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> and and we had the whole Navy out. I mean, not the whole Navy, but yeah. several hundred sailors to do a lot of hard work. Well, yeah. Helping it clear it up. Right. Anyway, that's the story. And the, wow. That's a pretty incredible story. I found that airplane about three months later, about a thousand miles south, and uh, because they had drifted off, and uh, we had uh, we were flying to Zamboanga in the southern Philippines, and here was that little airplane. And I had <laughs> I had three vice presidents from Procter and Gamble aboard, and they had a ship, a ten or eighteen thousand ton ship, loading copra. We, uh, waiting to load Cobra, and uh, there's no way that it's going to, this guy, Dr. Gamble, is going to let this ship sit there and not be loaded. And uh, so I couldn't, they discouraged me <laughs> vehemently from considering us going chasing, chasing, yeah. chasing it down. <laughs> so it was seen later several times. And reported by the constabulary, but we never got it back. <laughs> you never got it back. Um, yeah, I uh, um, I printed out your your outline, but we can't seem to put our hands on it right now. Is there any any other um, you know areas you want to touch on today? And we could always do this you know again on another day. To right. Yeah. We we usually try to keep the the session to about a forty five minutes to an hour because you know we know it can be kind of tiring. Um, um, so, no, we could just kind of do some concluding questions and wrap things up, if that's okay with you. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have, or what advice would you have, given your very fascinating and diverse life experiences, what advice would you have for Linfield College students today? Well, don't go to the... Don't go to the Far Eastern or Southern Islands uh, unless you have a reason to go there because it's, it's pretty barren and there's no communication in many of the islands and it's not a place to be without support. I think they're looking for something like stay in school. <laughs> well, they might well, yeah, stay in school. <laughs> That's for sure. But uh, the only reason I was gone, I was in the service and for, for several years in the Air Corps and uh, flew many of those islands and began to realize that the Pacific Ocean is no small pond. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's 
so much salt water out there that I don't want to go down to an airplane. Fair enough. So when we say Linfield College, when we say those words, what immediately pops into your mind? Is there an image or a feeling or a memory that immediately comes to mind? I grew up with Linfield. You see, I lived in McMinnville, about a mile from campus. And so there was no question where I was going to go to school. <clears throat> Besides, the dollar was a, a very big item in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got, I think I had a small scholarship, if I remember right. And uh, that helped. And uh, so I, I stayed in McMinnville. And uh, until then you went. Well, yes, I, I left, and uh, that's another story too. But I don't want to start that now. But but he's uh, he's always been very. Uh, I know both my kids have toured Linfield. Um, we've got a senior in high school. We don't uh, know where she's going to go yet. But uh, you know, everybody uh, has heard Jack's stories about. Uh, Linfield and all it you know has a, a you know warm warm regard for the for the campus and the community and the people yeah well that's great to hear I think we've got a really <laughs> solid community here still so Alicia probably would agree I would agree for sure <laughs> yeah Pardon? so they're Pardon? agreeing with you oh yeah. Dr. Taylor was a chemistry professor. And Don Taylor, his son, was one of my best friends. And, uh, so we had a long association with Linfield. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I only went to school there two years. And then the service offered me a, a position. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we left after two years only because Uncle Sam was inviting yeah. us to do something else. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to talk about before we conclude? I'll be very glad to uh, have you come up board by phone again if you have other questions that, that come up in your discussions. And if there's any, anything I can answer, I'll be glad to. Yeah. He's, he's got a million more stories. <laughs> well, we really appreciate your time, and this has been a lot of fun for us to hear more details about some of these moments in your life. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. Yeah, thank you You're very, very much. Welcome. You're very welcome. If you have other, other questions, don't, don't be bashful. They won't bother me. I'm, uh, I'm retarded and retired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know where you live, and we have your phone number, and um, yeah, it will definitely take you up on that if it turns out that we want to follow up on, on some of these issues. Sure, and if it's, uh, you know, when you're done with it, I don't know how you're going to, if it's all going to be audio or you're going to publish some kind of a little article or something, we'd love to see, uh, uh, you know, see the, uh, the results if there's copies available. Yes, absolutely. I should have said that at the outset, that once we get everything edited um, so that it's ready for public viewing or listening, right. um, we'll we'll send you a copy. Make sure you have a copy. Okay, great. And or, you know, if you just have a link at a website or something, you know, okay. whatever, whatever works. You know. okay. Now, if you want, and if you have a question, please don't be bashful. Yeah. Because I've... Mm -hmm. Dropped a lot of this in your lap today. Well, and plus, you know, if, if this is early going, you know, you may get uh, other lines of inquiries that, you know, you come up from other people you talk to. Absolutely. That's already starting to happen. So, yeah. um, right. I, in fact, I think because we've done a few other interviews, our questions were better today than the first time. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> we're learning as yeah. we go. Well, that's what it's all about, so. Well, we appreciate your guys' time, and uh, this has been fun. Yeah. And don't yeah. be back. Okay. All right. Don't be back. All right. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. It's been great talking with All you. All right. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Happy Valentine's Day. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. And bye for now.